So this morning we are looking at how that Christ's love holds things together. So that's, that should be interesting. Christ's love will hold things together. Now sometimes when we think of love, <laughs> I think of it, you know, in the movies and things like that. You know, it's just, we know where that goes. Um, but we see that love is not, we think that love conquers all. We think of love as um, being peaceable and gentle and kind. And those are the characteristics of the, how that love presents itself and how that love is able to maybe have an impact on, on individual's life. But how does love affect us and how does love change us? Well, it's important that we see how that God is going to work with us. So today, um, I was thinking of how that David and Goliath, you know, during that whole scenario with Goliath. Goliath was an individual that we know that propelled David to prominence in, in, in the kingdom of Israel. We know that he was just a shepherd boy. We know that prior to his coming in there and fighting Goliath, that Samuel came to his house and came to the family and anointed him to be king. So he goes to the battlefield where the armies of Israel are at war, and Goliath is standing there and challenging everyone, while David is the guy who goes and conquers, it, conquers Goliath, takes him out with a slingshot. But we also know that it pushed David to national prominence. But what we seldom consider is that David, even though he's anointed king, he comes in is this national prominence. He goes out in the battles, and he's working, and he's working with the, you know, the battles, and they come back, and they're singing, David has slain his you know, 10,000s, and Saul has only you know, his thousands. So Saul became jealous of David. And so for, I think it was about 13 years, Saul tried to kill David. Third, for 13 years, he pursues him through the country, pursues him through all these, you know, trying to kill him. Has the, he's on the nation's most wanted list. He's at the top. Okay, we got to kill him. Well, what we have here is David learning, David learning how God works in his life. We have David learning how to trust God in the most adverse circumstances, in the most adverse ways. Because he has, he, here he is, he's, he's got a special destiny. He's been anointed by God to be king, but instead he's running through the countryside fleeing for his life. And it's in these, in these places of being in conflict, being in peril, not knowing whether he was going to live or die. It was in those places that God and he became very close. And that's where we find David writing and having this understanding about God. So we can look at the giants and we can look at the big things we face, but we need to look at how that the little things in life, how that the everyday things, are helping us to understand that God is with us. That God is here and God is helping us. And, and how would David understand this? Except he went through all of these trials. And, you know, the Bible says that David is a man after God's own heart. We often think, well, you know, whenever he sinned, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But God wasn't caught up in David's failure. God understood David's heart. And it was, in, it was David's heart that helped him in those 13 years stay faithful to God and stay on course for his mission. And even whenever Saul and his, you know, having the armies out after David and hunting him, one night Saul sleeping, his camp's there, surrounded by soldiers. David sneaks in and he cuts a strip of cloth off of the king's robe and goes out up on the hill and he calls out to Saul and he says, Saul, I could have killed you, but don't pursue me. You know, I did nothing wrong. And Saul, for the moment in that period of time, he, he, he recanted and said, oh, I'm sorry, and goes back, goes back home. But later on, he continues the fight. And I was looking at Psalm, Psalm 103. And this is a Psalm of David. 
And whenever we think of David being this 13 years out in the uh, desert and out fleeing for his life, not knowing if he's going to live or die, only knowing that he can trust in God and that God has anointed him for something in his future, but he doesn't see that future. He doesn't see any hope of that future. But God has a place for David. That God has a place for us. We have to learn to be in this place and be comfortable in this place that God is with us. Psalm 103, beginning at verse 6. God makes everything come out right. He puts victims back on their feet. So, I mean, when you think about this, here David is saying God puts victims back on their feet. David is a victim. He did nothing wrong. He served. He served in the military. He conquered Goliath. He saved the enemy. I mean, he saved Israel from their enemy. And then he's just sought after. And Saul tries to kill him, run spears through him, trick him, hide him, whatever. He always puts him on the most wanted list. And David says, God makes everything come out right. He's able to look back over all of these things. He puts victims back on their feet. The next verse talks about Moses, how he went about his work. And then God is sheer mercy and grace. He is not easily angered. He's rich in love. God is sheer mercy and grace. See, God does not reward us according to what we deserve. It's mercy. It's grace. His grace is always towards us to help us, to heal us from the inside out. You know, changing behavior isn't what God is about. God is about changing the heart. And in the heart, when the heart changes, then the outward man changes. God is able to do this. He's able to heal us from the inside. So he is sheer mercy and grace. He doesn't endlessly nag or scold. (laughs) He's, you know... What are your thoughts? And we think about our thoughts. (laughs) Think about our thoughts. Uh, If you think about your thoughts, most of the time our thoughts are against us. Most of the time we, we are against ourselves and fight against ourselves. So we're in there telling ourselves how bad we are, and then along comes something good, like Sunday morning, (laughs) We come to church and we hear the word of God and God says he doesn't have a bad thought against us. We say, okay, I need to change my thinking. That lasts about 30 seconds. (laughs) And then we go back to the same old recording. You know, if you watch the same movie, which I do over and over again, (laughs) Rhonda will tell you, I watch some of those westerns, the outlaw Josie Wells, you know, yeah, yeah, you know. The worms got to eat as much as, the, the, the scavengers got to eat as much as the worms, you know. <laughs> That's a line in the movie. Somewhat quotable. But, um, you know, we can get out the popcorn and we can get out, and she gets the popcorn and she don't watch my movie. But you can get out the popcorn and the end never changes. So when we have something wrong in our life and we go back to the projector and we start replaying it, and replaying it, and digging up all of those bad emotions and those poor emotions, and we sit there and watch the same movie over and over and over again, we begin to start to believe that this is how it's always going to be. But it's not true. God has a plan and a purpose for our life, and the past is past. It's a teaching. It's a place for teaching. It's a place for understanding. See, David, how does he understand God? He doesn't have the Bible. He doesn't have, he just has a history book of the nation of Israel and how that Moses led, God used Moses, but it's from that that he begins to try and understand this relationship with God. And David could, you know, kill Saul, but he refuses to. He refuses to interfere with Saul. He says, God puts Saul in place. God will take Saul out. Until then, I must wait. (laughs) And you see, sometimes we can't change the circumstances. Sometimes we can't change things. So we're learning how to deal with them 
in a healing way with God's grace and God's mercy. He doesn't nag. He doesn't scold us. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't treat us according to our failures, nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as the heaven is over the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. Fear him is a reverential awe. We've been in that place where God's mercy and grace come to our lives. And in that place where God's mercy and grace comes to our lives, that's where we find the reverential fear, the reverential awe. God's Spirit washes over us. God's Spirit washes over us. He washes over us like water coming down over us. God's Spirit washes us in our inside. And he changes us and he changes our heart. Not because we're scolded, but because we want to. And as high as the heavens are over the earth, so strong is his love to us. That, and as far as the sun rises from the sunset, he has separated our sins from us. Our sins don't matter anymore. They're never brought up against us again. Our sins are separated and never remembered. There is no movie of our failures. There's no movie of our sin. That movie is destroyed. God doesn't watch it. And God doesn't want us watching it. He doesn't want us to watch over our failures. He doesn't want us to watch over our, our things that have gone wrong in our life. He wants us to be forgiven and allow the sins of the past to be in the past, and allow our future to be in, fr in front of us. He knows us inside out and out, and keeps uh, in mind that we've been made of mud. You know, we're frail. We're frail. God is with us. We're frail. And he treats us that way. He doesn't treat us like hardened criminals or hardened hearts he's he's able to do these things within us and make a change making everything right the last verse there that is making everything right for them and their children as they follow his covenant ways and remember to do whatever he said you see we try to remember what god has said not so that he that we can make him happy but that we can find our place in our life. We're not pleasing God, we're fulfilling our dream. You know, I'm trying to make God happy. God is already happy. <laughs> I want God to love me. He already loves you. I want God to care for me. He already cares for you. <laughs> That's why his spirit washes us. You see, loving, <laughs> God loves us uniquely. God loves us uniquely. Now, I have a blanket here, <laughs> and we think of a blanket. Um, now, is this your favorite color? <laughs> Blue is, yeah. But you see, we look at the blanket, but everybody, we say God's love for us is like a blanket. It covers us all. But you know what? God's love for us is unique to us. Just as this blanket is unique to me, it may not be exactly what is what you need. God, on a scale of 1 to 10, he gives me a 10 of what I need. His blanket love for me is a 10. But you know, the blanket love that he has for you may not be this. It is still a 10, but it's uniquely made for you. God has a unique covering for your life from the inside out, and it's always a 10. It's always the best. And so me trying to be like Bob and Bob trying to be like me doesn't make it. My blanket, here, Bob, this is, what God, this is how God loves me. You wear it. It doesn't fit him. It doesn't work for Bob because God's unique blanket of love is different for Bob. It's still a 10, but it's different. And that's why each life is uniquely different, uniquely our own. 
And God understands that uniqueness down to the very fiber of our being, down to the very fiber of his love for us. You see, this is what makes God so uniquely different. He made us uniquely different. And that we see God coming to David in a way that he doesn't, he doesn't come to us. He comes to us in a different way than he came to David. But David writes about it. And we find in Colossians, Paul writes about it. Last week, um, I've, been, I, you know, I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about that thought, last week's sermon. Did a comparison between Peter and John. But while, during the week, I've been thinking about that a little more. Excuse me. And there's Judas and Peter and John. Now, Judas' personality was Jesus has to continue to, pr- Jesus has to, continue to prove himself over and over and over again. And the whole time, Judas is writing off everything that Jesus is doing because he's got the money bag and he's stealing from God. He's stealing from Jesus. And he doesn't want it to be different. He wants Jesus to continue uh, doing what he's doing, and he can still take money out of the, out of the pot, and, and it's all okay. Well, Judas, I like the phrase, Judas, I don't like the phrase, but I mean the phrase that states, Judas hung himself before he could see Jesus hang on the cross for him. You see, Jesus would have forgiven Judas had he just stuck it out a little more. But that's, you know, it's entirely different. But John, do you remember the difference between Peter and John? Peter is always saying, you know, I'm, you know I, Peter's trying to prove that he's a good disciple. He's trying to prove to Jesus that he's the best, you know? So when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, he says, no, no, don't wash mine, you know? You, know, you can't go and wash my feet, you know? And Jesus said, I either wash your feet or you have no part of my kingdom. And then Peter says, oh, th- give me a bath. <laughs> you know, good old Peter. <laughs> and then we have Peter at the Last Supper, and Jesus is saying, though, everybody's going to betray me. And Peter stands up and says, hey, Jesus, these other guys may betray you, but not me. I'm not going to betray you. And, J- and Peter had the best of intentions because Peter would have died in the garden to protect Jesus. But Jesus didn't want Peter to die physically. Peter wanted, God, Jesus wanted Peter to die intentionally inside to himself, to his pride and to his thinking that he was, have to prove himself. Then, of course, then there's John. And John says, you know, John is the beloved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And what does he do? He leans back on Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He leans on Jesus at the Last Supper. He has this unique relationship where in the, in the gospel he calls himself over five times the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's not arrogance. That's an understanding. And we need to arrive at that place where I can lean on Jesus and that he loves me that much that it's not a bother to him. It's not a bother to Jesus for me to be here with him or for me to ask him for a need or for a prayer or for help. It's not a bother. He loves us so much. You see, and, and Paul, uh, Paul says to the Colossians, verse 15 of chapter, chapter 1, we look at his son and see the God who cannot be seen. <laughs> when we look at Jesus in the Gospels, We are seeing God. God has come to be with us. And as we read the Gospels, as we read these things, we're we're not only reading them as history, we're reading them as God's Word made alive to be able to not only, you know, it isn't just written down, it is the living history. It is a living history. But it is also, since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is a living reality that is with us in our lives. It is the living God touching a living person. 
It is a living God, loving God, healing a broken heart and healing a wounded spirit. It is a living and loving God who touches me in a very real way that allows me to be so comfortable with God. I just lean back and know that he's with me. I'm safe here. I'm safe here. Sometimes it's hard to do that. Sometimes when you are with people, at the worst, no, I won't say the worst of times in their life, at the times when they are experiencing the most difficulties and the most questions, to be that voice and to be that presence that brings them comfort and peace. One person, and say this humbly, he says, just the sound of your voice brings peace. I was thinking, boy, I should learn what that sound is. <laughs> you know, but just the sound of your voice. It isn't the sound of me. It's the sound of the Spirit coming through my voice to touch the heart. And see, it's that Spirit and that presence that heals us from the inside, heals our mind, our thinking, heals our heart, heals our body, gives us strength and gives us whether it's, you know, a cancer patient taking medication and, and believing that this is what's going to work to heal their body, yes. And we go forward with 100% expectation, we're going to get better. But you see, it's God. It's, how, do we, how do we know what God looks like? It isn't made up in our mind. It's made up in the reality of what we see in the Scriptures, of Jesus loving and touching and healing and restoring David being in the desert for 13 years. You see, God giving him the grace and the mercy to flee for his life when he's the victim. He did nothing wrong. He did everything right. And he's anointed to be king. And he's still running for his life for 13 years. You see, the difficulties that come in our lives are there to... God wouldn't have them there if they weren't for a purpose. And the purpose is for us to see God in us, the uniqueness of our blanket. The uniqueness of our covering is the uniqueness of our personality, of our need, uh, of who we are as a person, of our travels, of our, of our staying and our going and our coming in. You know, everything is uniquely ours. And God has given us a very thin blanket to put on when it's very hot. That's a huge joke. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. Everything finds its purpose in God. Everything. The little atoms, <laughs> you know, floating around here we don't even see. Everything has its purpose in him. Every part of us does too. He was there before any of it came into existence. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He is the supreme in the beginning and leading to the resurrection, and he is supreme in the end. Everything finds its purpose in him. You see, <laughs> there is only one person we need to worry about, and that person is Jesus. <laughs> we don't need to worry about him like, is he going to make it? <laughs> but as our worry or our concern would be that we would grieve his spirit and somehow cause God not to work fully in our lives. And then Romans, uh, this last thing it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, verse 6 through 8, we cannot understand someone um, but God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatsoever to him. While we were of no use to God, he died for us. And so this is where we find our place and our purpose 
is that God is alive within us. He is there to <laughs> He is there to hold our life together in the most trying of times. He is there to hold us in his hand and hold us in his presence. He is there to is there to make sense out of what doesn't make sense. So, God's love, Christ's love, holds it all together. So when we look at our life and we look at the surroundings, we look at our government, we look, we look at our nation, we look at ourselves, we're still there in his presence. We are forgiven, surrender, <laughs> surrendering it all to Christ. In there, I'll close with that. In surrendering it all to Christ, in, in you know, the song we were singing in, in earlier. Um, all to Jesus I surrender. I surrender all. I used to, I mean, we sang that. I sang that as a kid growing up in the church and whatever. And I always thought of it as, okay, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender all to you. But as you were singing that this morning, I thought of David and his 13 years of running for his life. He had to surrender his whole life to God. Every time that he was running for his life or hiding for his life, he was surrendering his life and his will to God. And so surrendering to God is not giving up and laying in a cave somewhere and waiting to die. Surrendering to God is going out and living your life knowing that God is with me and he's going to take care of me, he's going to guide me, he's going to help me. God, I surrender my life, I, I surrender my thoughts, I surrender what I speak, I surrender what I do, I ask you, O oh God, to help me through each day. Amen? I surrender all. <laughs> Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, <laughs> forgive me of my sins and make me whole. Make me complete. I am a complete person in Christ. Now I go out to live life, not to compete in life, not to succeed in life, but to live life in complete surrender to God. In doing so, I will find my purpose, God's will, and God's place. Amen? Let's stand, shall we? <laughs> Jesus, I surrender all. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my sins to you. I surrender my failures to you. I surrender my attitude to you. I surrender my complacency. I surrender my anger. I surrender my peace. I surrender all to you, O God, knowing that you will forgive me. And as far as the east is from the west, so far are those sins separated from me. God, I know you have a plan for me. I know you have a purpose. I know you have a direction. I know that your will and your love and your blessing is upon me. I know that you will provide for me. I know, O oh God, that you will make a way for me. I know, O oh God, that in you I shall find the peace of life and the peace of understanding, the peace of accomplishment, the peace of surrender. So, Jesus, come to us. God, you're already here. Help us, O oh God, to see you. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus. Oh, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Oh, Jesus, touch me again. Oh, Jesus, quiet the spirit within me. Give me life, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. God bless you. <laughs>